is 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings I've heard about together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me... Have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B, R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a high-altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, 
What about alien abduction? Uh, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe from the North Pole to the South. 
The Arctic Tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometers each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event, and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location, because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? Who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work. And you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work, all for shopping, without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices. You may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area, or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses which, incidentally, are the most common. And for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings, things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs, are all in good working order because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order may be very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So, until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 44 and 45. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, 
Early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors, such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So, that's a very different story from the early research. So, what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.